I believe in the future, wires will unite different cities. And a man in one part of the country may communicate with another in a distant place. When Alexander Graham Bell wrote those words in 1878, he foreshadowed the basic problems for all future research in communication. Even though, at the time, the telephone itself was only two years old. A man in one part of the country may communicate with another in a distant place. First, research had to meet the challenge of getting man's voice clearly to that distant place, the problem of transmission. It was, of course, the miracle of the telephone that made possible the transmission of speech by transforming the speaker's voice into electrical waves. Hello. To be changed back to sound waves at the other end of the wire. Hello. But over long distances, the voice gradually faded away. How are you? How are you? Despite that fact, by 1912, a man in New York could talk into a telephone. Talk louder. And with the aid of various devices, he could be heard more or less distinctly in Denver. Not louder. But without something to strengthen voice signals along the way, that seemed about as far as people could talk. Then came the Audion vacuum tube invented by Dr. Lee DeForest. With continued research and development, Dr. Harold Arnold of Bell Telephone Laboratories improved the original design to obtain a better vacuum. The new tubes enabled engineers to build amplifiers, which were effective voice boosters. At last, it was possible to complete the line from coast to coast. 1915, the first transcontinental telephone line made front page news. But there were still telephone men who knew the job had only started. It's a great accomplishment. Nobody can doubt that. All of you men have talked over this so-called transcontinental line just as I have. By the time my voice hits Frisco, I sound like Jenny Lynn. <laughs> or vice versa. I only wish it was funnier. One of the really rough problems is those vacuum tube amplifiers. Each one we use on the line adds its own distortion to the conversation. You're right. The amplifiers are a problem. By the way, do any of you men know what the word telephone really means? It's from two Greek words, meaning far and sound. And I would say that if we had one main job, all of us, it is to make darn sure that the far sound isn't far. So we have got to improve those amplifiers. I don't know. At $22 for one three-minute call, I'm not sure the public is going to sort of jump over itself to call coast to coast. Oh, don't you believe it. The way this country is growing, there'll be plenty of people who'll want to call. Once we get the cost down. The problem is how? Well, I know one way. Personally, I feel in the year 1915, it is a waste of our customers' money for one pair of wires to carry only one conversation. You know, we've been working on that carrier idea, but it's still a long way from being good enough. Well, we've got to make it good enough. We'll need a carrier system that will send at least five conversations on one wire. Five conversations on one line. Impossible? <laughs> Not at all. Three years later in 1918, five individual conversations could be transmitted on one pair of wires with an improved carrier system. How did it work? Well, Carrier transmitted a far wider band of frequencies on one pair of wires than a single conversation required. The extra conversations hitchhiked along those frequencies without interfering with one another. At the other end, the conversations were filtered apart and sent on to their separate destination.
carrier was a big step toward better service at lower cost. But with more and more conversations on one line, the problem of distortion had to be solved. A voice going across country by carrier, which started out in San Francisco sounding like this. Hello? Was apt to arrive in New York sounding more like this. As the years passed, men sought ways to free the far sound from such distortion. Finally, in 1927, a young telephone scientist named Harold Black made use of the fact that an amplifier would distort a voice signal. Hello? Black took a small fraction of that distorted voice signal and put it through a feedback circuit to reverse the distortion. The reversed voice signal was put back into the amplifier. Thus, the very tendency of the amplifier to distort now produced a signal that was almost distortion-free. Hello? The feedback principle worked with so many voices at once that more conversations than ever before could now be carried clearly on a single line. But still, beyond a certain limit, extremely high frequencies would fade out, as though nature herself had said, thus far, no farther. But scientists and engineers have a way of confounding nature in their struggle to bring the far sound near. They conceived the idea of enclosing a single wire inside a copper tube to provide a protective pathway for conversations. This was coaxial cable. Each one of those early tubes carried 200 conversations at one time. The inventors of coaxial have long since retired from active work at the laboratory. But their remarkable achievement in creative thinking was the basis for further research and development that resulted in cables that can carry nearly 2,000 conversations in every pair of copper tubes. What's more, the laying of the first coaxial cable in 1936 meant that television networks could be established throughout the country as they were after the war, when towers rising across the land made network television even more practical and provided another way to carry telephone conversations to distant places. Radio Relay was an outgrowth of earlier research in radio and radar. Radar transmitted high-frequency radio waves. When some of them struck a distant object, they were reflected back to highly sensitive antennas. Like radar, microwave radio relay also transmitted very high frequency radio waves. But research found a way to narrow the beam and aim it with great precision toward a receiving antenna on the distant horizon. That beam, like an invisible wire through the air, served as carrier to transmit first nearly 500 conversations, then 1,200, and then 1,800 conversations at once, racing from tower to tower at speed of light. However, some frequencies were so high that rain and snow interfered with them. Once again, it seemed as if nature could limit man's progress in bringing the far sound near. But even as far back as the early 1930s, Dr. George Southworth, now retired, had been experimenting with the transmission of high frequencies through hollow pipes called wave guides. Recent tests promise that these experimental wave guides may be able to transmit 200,000 telephone conversations at one time. 200,000 voices through a hollow pipe from what began as one voice on a single wire. Thus, much has been achieved in the art of transmitting man's voice to that distant place. But what when there were many men at that distant place and only one was meant to hear? This was the second major problem foreseen by Bell so many years ago. The problem of connecting or switching a given call to one specific person out of many. 
To connect one telephone with one other telephone, only one line was required. Connecting three telephones required only three lines. But to interconnect five would require 10 lines. Seven, 21 lines. And for 10, you would need 45. And interconnecting 100 telephones would require over 4,900 lines. So it became evident early in telephone history that central offices were needed for switching calls. To make connections, the telephone companies used the most valuable invention of all time, an invention for which, unfortunately, Bell System Research cannot take credit. The girl operator had all the qualifications that were required to make connections in those days. She had responsiveness. Number, please. Operator, get me Boston Parkway 32. She had memory. Boston Parkway 32. Yes, sir. She had the mechanical dexterity to handle the switching process. I'm sorry, sir. The Boston lines are all busy. And she had logic to select another route if no line was available. Perhaps I can connect you through Hartford. Hartford, get me Boston, Parkway 32. Memory, logic, and mechanical dexterity. All were there in that original switching system. But it's another of the wonders of research and development that they are all here, too, in a modern telephone office. Today's automatic switching system can remember each digit of a number as you dial it. It provides the logic to figure out the route your call should take. And it has the mechanical dexterity to send your call quickly on its way. But despite all the advances in automatic equipment, thousands of women are still required to ensure the personal attention so important to good telephone service. However, with today's direct distance dialing, a customer in New York can dial his own call to San Francisco. If one route is busy, the equipment automatically tries alternate routes until it completes the call at a speed close to magic. And the cost of the call is just about $2, instead of the $22 it cost back in 1915. This fabulously efficient equipment produced by Western Electric, manufacturing arm of the Bell system, makes possible the automatic transmission and switching of 200 million telephone conversations in a single day to bring the far sound ever nearer, ever clearer. The improvement of communications never stops at Bell Telephone Laboratories. Thousands of technicians, engineers, and scientists work in these buildings in New Jersey that are the center of research and development activities for the Bell system. The leaders at Bell Laboratories have always believed that research scientists should have freedom of ideas, freedom of action. A man is free to seek what truths he will, working alone, or with others who also seek new knowledge, which will add to man's understanding of his world. This concept of freedom guides men who have been seeking answers for a lifetime. It guides men whose days of searching have just begun. An advance in communications at Bell Laboratories is only the takeoff point for basic research scientists who seek constantly for new knowledge. For example, these relay switches link the pathway for your calls across town and across the nation. They can open or close a circuit in a thousandth of a second. Fast? Sure, but not fast enough for this electronic age. Engineers knew they could replace those relays with vacuum tubes. A tube could operate as a switch in two millionths of a second. However, tubes require more power than relays and they generate more heat. Therefore, they require more space and in many cases, a tube has a limited lifespan. Rather than either a relay or a vacuum tube, what they really needed was a device smaller than a relay that would operate as fast as a vacuum tube on far less power, generate little or no heat, 
and last practically forever. And if, like the vacuum tube, this device could amplify as well as switch, it would be out of this world. But it was too much to expect that basic research would ever find such a device. Or was it? On a day in 1946, in their search for new knowledge, Bell Laboratory scientists stepped up a long continuing study with certain unusual solid materials called semiconductors. These are neither good conductors of electricity like copper, nor good insulators like glass. They're somewhere in between. A new frontier can be a mountain range, or it can be a piece of material held in a man's hand, like this semiconductor germanium. Much of the work with semiconductors was in theory, with formula leading to formula. There were endless experiments to test these theories. In one, a piece of germanium through which a current was flowing was placed in a magnetic field. The magnetic field deflected the electrons to one side of the sample and fulfilled one of the predictions about the nature of semiconductors. In this photoelectric effect experiment, a spinning disk interrupts a beam of light directed toward a piece of germanium, which is dipped into a liquid conductor of electricity. The results, when measured, proved that light causes a change in the charge on the surface of the semiconductor. And there were tests involving a piece of germanium set a hair's breadth from a vibrating metal electrode. The changes observed revealed how the electrical nature of the atoms near the surface of a semiconductor differs from that of atoms beneath the surface. Finally, on a morning in December 1947, theory stood at the threshold of proof. The experimenters had wired into a circuit this small device. Without connecting the device into the circuit, this was the sound. But when it was connected, the sound was much louder than before. Here was the first transistor. It could amplify and switch. Born out of pure research, it was to revolutionize the communications world. For their discovery of the transistor, Walter Bratton, William Shockley, and John Bardeen were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1956 in Stockholm, where another Bell scientist, Clinton Davison, had received a similar honor in 1937. This scientific breakthrough meant that far smaller assemblies, using transistors and other new semiconductors, could be built to replace conventional switching equipment. An experimental electronic central office of the future is undergoing tests at Bell Laboratories. Occupying but a single room, this electronic central office will one day make possible many unheard of telephone services for home and business. And it will serve as many telephones faster and better than a building full of equipment does today. Today, when the transistor has been put to use in thousands of applications, from hearing aids to satellite transmitters, Few remember it is only one of the many valuable byproducts that were born in communications research. For example, the first practical talking motion pictures were an outgrowth of earlier Bell system work in sound recording. As far back as 1927, a television system was operating successfully between Washington, D.C and Bell Laboratories in New York. In World War II, German buzz bombs threatened England's very survival. But radar gun directors developed with the help of Bell telephone scientists and engineers enabled gunners to destroy the deadly terror before it ever reached its target. The distant early warning line and other communication systems across the Arctic wastes have grown out of telephone research and development. 
as have the invaluable guidance systems for intercontinental missiles. And guidance systems for interceptor missiles that can seek out and destroy approaching missiles. But as important as telephone research has been to our national defense, its primary aim remains the constant improvement of communications. Here the heart of the Bell solar battery, prominent in plans for satellite communications, goes into an oven for treatment. Two heads are apparently better than one for telephone research in the science of sound. This experiment reveals how people are able to locate the direction of sound. The equipment in this huge echoless chamber, including microphones in the dummy's head, permits acoustic scientists to influence the girl's hearing of test sounds. This new knowledge is expected to bring improvements in transmission of both radio and TV stereophonic programs. This tiny memory plate installed in a central office may mean that when you are going out for the evening, you can simply dial in a number where you can be reached and have your calls forwarded automatically. Machines that talk to machines. Research in data transmission means that tomorrow's business will be able to transmit a hundred page report coast to coast in a matter of seconds. This astonishing new device is known as the optical maser. It operates on the power of an ordinary light bulb to project a thin rod-like invisible beam of light that may eventually carry telephone calls and television programs. Scientists believe that in the future, the optical maser will be able to carry many hundreds of thousands of telephone calls and television programs all at one time on a single beam of light. The day when all of us can see, as well as hear, the party we are telephoning is still some years away. But test models are already in daily use between two telephone laboratories 30 miles apart. Who knows, the housewife of tomorrow may do her shopping like this. This is Satellite Echo, an aluminized reflector balloon 10 stories high. When Satellite Echo was launched by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in August 1960, it made news that turned the eyes of all the world skyward. A scientist spoke into the telephone in California, and his voice signals were bounced off satellite echo in outer space and reflected back to Earth to be heard by a telephone scientist in New Jersey. This fantastically sensitive receiving equipment developed at Bell Laboratories amplified the faint signals from outer space 10 million times and made possible that first conversation bounced off a man-made moon. Telephone men next designed more sophisticated satellites, powered by solar batteries and equipped with radio transmitters and receivers. Part of the preparations for orbiting the first satellite, built and launched at private industry's expense. As ever more efficient satellites are sent to outer space, the intellectual thrust for new knowledge by research scientists will bring the day ever closer when man has a better understanding of his world and its place in the universe. To search the heavens with a giant ear and listen for the whisper of the stars. To see within the molecule, the atom, and within the atom, the unfathomable secrets of its parts to delve the boundless depths of one's own mind, to find some truth which, through all time, has defied the finding, to strive to ignite a single spark which will flame another candle against the dark, that man may better know his world. 
This is the spirit of research, the spirit which carries the scientists in communications ever forward. A man in one part of the country may communicate with another in a distant place. Only yesterday, that distant place was across a continent. Today, across the sea. Tomorrow, to all peoples of all lands. And the day after, who can say? But one thing is sure, in the days that lie ahead, from however far man may wish to communicate with man, Bell system scientists and engineers will continue to find new ways to bring the far sound near. <laughs>